just because they were more experienced. You know, I didn't want to go off and play Barbies. I wanted to go out to a club and dance. Also, adults, when she worked, were very accepting of her. Right. They were never critical. And when she would come back to school and try to assimilate and just try to be like all the other kids, there was a group of kids that was that would really stick it to her very resentful tell her she was fat she was a cow she was ugly i mean this was day after day after day after day and after six hours five days a week of getting non-stop you know putting put down i didn't want to come home and discuss more of it you know mm -hmm. i just wanted to try and forget about it so you started drinking at nine mm -hmm. to prove a point or to feel good or to get drunk or what well, I didn't really know. I mean, when I was eight, I had had two glasses of champagne. And boom, I was like tipsy and, mm -hmm. you know, bubbly in the life of the party. And I felt so good. All my problems had seemed, you know, to disappear for that hour that I was out of it. And, uh, well, and I didn't realize that until I was nine and I started casually drinking. And realize where God, would you get alcohol from at nine? Uh, parties, friends, bars, uh, clubs. What were you doing at bars at nine? A lot of the time it was for parties that I was invited to. A lot of the time I would walk up and they would be like, oh, it's little Drew Barrymore. Come right in. Good publicity, you know. And where um, were you when she was going to parties and bars at nine? I was never with her at bars at nine, um, but I would go with her to parties. There were mm -hmm. a lot of industry functions and mm -hmm. then private social slash business functions. And um, when we got there, we would stay together for time, then she would go her way and I would go my way. And not knowing about the problem, um, I was not as um, scrutinizing as I should have been. You just decided to just let her have some space? Yes. Nine or ten, that's exactly the age where you need some guidance, some oh, definition, definitely. some... You don't need a parent to back off and give you space at 9 mm -hmm. or 10, especially if you were where Drew was at that time. Part of it was the fact that I didn't have a dad. I, I felt like my mom was abandoning me because she was always off at work. Um, Do you know now how you got to be so confused? I mean, how does a person born who looks like you do, who... You know, comes from the kind of ancestry that you come from, the kind of family, and is friends with Spielberg and E.T. How do you get to be so depressed? How does that happen? Well, How could you not look in the mirror and think you were beautiful? How could you not think, gee, this is a wonderful life and I'm going to do everything to protect it? I never looked in the mirror and thought I was beautiful. I always had the lowest self-esteem of anybody I knew. And, um, I so was... So you'd look in the mirror and think what? That I was overweight, that I had a, you know, a round face. My eyes weren't good enough. My hair wasn't good enough. My legs were too short. My waist was too big. My feet were too big. My teeth weren't straight enough. I mean, just every little detail wasn't right. Are you at a point in your life now where you can accept that this is who you are? Because I went through this, and it took me a long time to get to the point where I could really just accept that I don't have that. That is not what I have. This is what I have, and I'm going to have to work with this. Are you there yet? Yeah, I'm there. Um, it's scary, you know, because I want to stay sober so bad. And, there, you know, there is a possibility that I could slip again. But I feel so confident right now in the fact that I do want to stay sober that I think that I, I feel that I have a really good chance at achieving sobriety for, you know, hopefully Part eternity. Seven, when she co-starred in E.T., the most successful film of all time. Uh, at age nine, she had her first drink. When she was 12, she was using cocaine. She told the powerful story of her addiction and her recovery in this new book called Little Girl Lost. Please welcome Drew Barrymore. <laughs> It has been a while. It's been a long, it's been about a year. Mm -hmm. um, when people look 
at that little girl in the film E.T. Or when people look at this, this little woman now, they probably have a hard time believing that uh, you got lost in alcohol and drug abuse. How did it happen? Um, it's well, a long story. <laughs> yeah, really, it's a very long story. Um, I got to a, a real bad place in my life, and uh, I wanted to do different things to try and cure it for a long mm -hmm. time. And when you say a bad place, what does that mean? Does the absence of a father have anything to do with it? Does uh, this business and its pressure have anything to do with it? Yeah, um, I felt real lonely for a long time. A lot of the feelings that I was going through that brought me down so far was feelings that every person in the whole world goes through. Being lonely, being depressed, having resentments against certain things that's gone on in your life. Um, me, I just, I didn't do the right things to take care of it. And it got way out of control. Yeah. Um, I know you were a young girl and you didn't have a lot of money accessible to you because they, they I guess they keep your money to your 18 right. or something. Where did you get the money for cocaine? Well, um, I would get like allowance and just any money I would get, I would spend it on drugs. Mm -hmm. um, you, I don't know, it's weird. I mean, at the time, it, I was always, it was hard because I was always like, oh, I don't have enough money for this, I don't have enough money for that. But I guess somehow you just seem to get it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, alcohol came first, right? Mm -hmm. Where did that first drink come from? Uh, I was at a party, and um, I got on a dare that I couldn't down two glasses of champagne, and I did. And uh, I got real lightheaded, and I fell over. And I, I loved the feeling. I thought it felt great. Mm -hmm. And um, and then I, I didn't drink for a long time, and then. I went to another party and I had beer and I felt the same way and I just, I liked the feeling. Yeah. Sort of took away those problems, you know. And, and that first glass of champagne, how old were you then? Um, I was eight when that happened, but um, the next time I had a drink was when I was nine. Yeah. Wow. What's the worst um, moment you've ever experienced? How bad did it get? Um, emotional or drug-wise? Drug-wise, first. Um, probably was one night, um, I usually got to a point where I couldn't do anymore, or I didn't want anymore. Uh, usually I, I stopped after a while, um, but one night I just kept going and going and going, and nothing, you know, I was partying for like 10 hours straight, mm. or 12, eight, 15 hours straight and I just didn't stop and didn't stop and I just like went out, went black for a long time and it was really scary and then I became a blackout drinker. Yeah. Did you go to your mom for help? Um, no. Um, I kept it from my mom for a long time. I would walk in drunk and just play it off, manipulate, do whatever I had to do so she wouldn't find out. Um, I didn't, at first it was because I didn't want to hurt her. Mm -hmm. And after a while, I just, all I, I just didn't want to hear it from her. So it t sort of turned around. Yeah. yeah. Has your mom ever had a problem with alcohol or drug abuse? No. So this is not something in your case that's genetic? Um, it isn't? Well, I mean, in your case, I, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm wondering. I, because I, I've heard that it can be genetic, but I'm wondering in your case, was it? Um... I don't know, because I'm not really a doctor, and um, I was, no, I, <laughs> I always wondered, I thought, well, you know, considering that every person on my dad's side of the family keeled over from drugs and alcohol, mm -hmm. that maybe that might have something to do with it. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, um, but then again, they weren't there holding a gun to my head to do it, so I, I think it was probably a cross between a lot of different things. Yeah, but, but that leans towards it being genetic, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just a little bit. I'm glad you came by. I've been trying to get you on the show for about a year, only because my kids um, are 12 to 34. The, de the demographers tell me. And um, I just think it's real important for them to know uh, what you've been through and that you're back.
there's somebody out there who really needs this conversation. We'll be right back with Drew Barrymore. <laughs> You actually went in for rehabilitation and came out and announced that you were cool and slipped back. Right. How did that happen? I think you were, you were sober for six months. Right. Um, and on my six-month day, I celebrated by getting loaded. <laughs> yeah, really. Way to go, Drew. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I got loaded that time because I wasn't doing it for myself at all. I was doing it to, like... Not really impress everybody, but um, it had gotten out months before that that I had a problem and it was on the cover of the tabloids and everything. And um, I was so sick of hearing about it, I thought, okay, I'll just prove it to them and I'll shut them up and I'll do this. So when I was staying sober that time, I was doing it for everybody else. Yeah. And um, you, you just can't stay sober that way because you have to want it for yourself. You can't have an ar ulterior motive for it. And that's why I got loaded. Is that one of the things they teach you while you're in, that you have to do it for yourself? And, and what else do they do? Um, they, um, it's like, it's a real, you know, emotional experience. They, they sort of like open you up and examine everything and they make you look at, you know, just every aspect and detail of why you're feeling these, this, this way. And um, it's, it's the most incredible thing that's ever happened to me in my life, but it was also probably one of the most painful to open yourself up again and examine all the things that you've pushed down so far for so long. And um, that was real hard for me to do, really hard, but I'm really glad I did. Do you worry now about slipping back? Is every day a struggle? Um, yeah, you can't, um, you can't really, like, wake up in the morning and um or like go through a day and just like sit there oh don't get loaded don't get loaded you know you just you've got to be really positive you know and you, you've got to make sure that you are going to be with people or be at places you know that you know you just don't put yourself in slippery situations you go to meetings you know you do things that make you happy yeah did you change all your friends yes all of them so peer pressure is tough and you are a product of your environment um well, peer pressure is pretty much everywhere, you know, some more than others. But if you, it's very easy to stay away from, too. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, if you're strong-willed and you don't want to be around it, it's very easy to stay away from. But it's also hard sometimes because you can get really caught up in it if you don't know what's going on. Um, and I did for a long time. Yeah. David Crosby of uh, Crosby, Seals, Nash fame was very instrumental in uh, creating a different environment for you, uh, him and his wife. Yeah. Why don't you talk about that? Um, well, after I got out of the hospital that I was in, um, I moved in with them. And I lived with them for a long, uh, for a while. And um, it was hard to adjust to at first because I've never had a dad. Mm -hmm. And... Um, now, he's, he's alive, but he's just never been around you? He, right. He's still alive? Yeah, he is still alive. I haven't spoken... I've spoken to him once in eight years, mm -hmm. and, um... And what was that conversation like, or about? Um, he wanted money from me. <laughs> no. Yeah. He, he's, he's real, like, messed up, and he's... He, he, if he was aware of his life, and he had had... He, if he had his stuff together, mm -hmm. he wouldn't be like he is. It's just that he's such an emotional wreck, and he's, like, ruined his life off drugs and alcohol that he's not really aware of what he does. It's like he doesn't really want to purposely hurt anybody, but since he's so shugana, mm -hmm. you know, he doesn't really get it. That's a Yiddish term? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow, Dad. Anyway, let's talk about David and his wife. So I moved in with them, and it was, like, hard to get used to at first because I'm not used to answering to a father figure. Mm -hmm. And um, it, was, it was so scary looking up to David, you know, this big guy, and just getting the courage up to just ask him if I could go out to dinner with somebody was frightening at first. And after a while, it, I really adjusted to it, and um, it was really nice. It was neat to be in an atmosphere like that because that's what I had hoped for for so long, is that kind of parental atmosphere, and, and it was really nice. 
It was really nice to be able to get a taste of that. Yeah. Well, I'm glad everything's together. I, I read a little bit of this. Uh, they sent me one of these, I guess, a couple months ago now. It's very interesting and, and very educational. Uh, kids, you should check this out. Uh, good luck. Hang tough. I'll give you a number. If you need somebody to talk to, you can call me at the crib. Okay? Okay. Two very more.